So our message tonight is going to be similar to weeks past each Sunday night for the past couple of Sundays and for a couple of weeks there at the end of July, we spoke on words that were opposites, but yet found their uh, unison in the gospel message. And tonight, our two words are going to be the word silence and uh, the word loud or the word volume, uh, something that was loud, the opposite of silent. However, Matt chooses to take that up. And so I'm going to deal with the word silence tonight. And uh, the verses I like to read are found in the Old Testament, very famous verses found in Isaiah 53 and verse 7. We'll read verse 6 for a connection. So if you have a Bible, we'll read these couple of verses together here. Isaiah 53 and verse 6. Verse 6 is actually the verse that I was saved through. I was saved, born again. I was 15 years old, and I was on my way to perishing. I was on my way uh, to a, a, a lost eternity. And I put my trust in Jesus Christ through the truth that I read in verse 6 here. So it's a very significant verse for me. We'll read it, and we'll read verse 7 as well. Verse 6 says this, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, that's Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. This is speaking about Jesus Christ as well. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. That's what we're going to read tonight for the gospel message. We have it twice here, twice here in this book of Isaiah. He opened not his mouth. Silence. From the man who created the voice box, from the one who is God's final communication to man, it's amazing to read those words that he opened not his mouth. And I'd like to speak on that just as an introduction in this meeting tonight about the silence that we hear about concerning Jesus Christ and about this gospel message. You know, the Bible is silent on a lot of things, but one thing it is not silent on. One thing it is not silent on is how you can know your sins forgiven. I was reading a survey yesterday written in a very popular Christian magazine, and it said this, people in the United States who call themselves Christians, it said this, that a survey was taken by the Arizona Christian University and their cultural research center did a survey recently, and, oh, and 52% of people who identify as Christians believe they will earn their way to heaven. They will earn their way to heaven, 52%. You say, what does that mean, Dave? It means this, they do not believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. They do not believe the gospel of Jesus Christ because the gospel message tells me this, Christ paid, Christ did the work. Everything was done by God. Nothing was done by me. Salvation is not earned. It's not achieved. It is received. And it is believed. Because I can do nothing. Because it's all because of grace. The Bible's not silent on that. It is so vibrantly loud. And so crystal clear. That faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. For by grace are you saved. Through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And yet, amazing to think we live in a country where more than half the people who identify as Christians believe they are earning their way to a place that is established in the grace of God, just what we don't deserve. Listen tonight to this gospel message and be absolutely sure that your salvation depends zero on you and 100% on Jesus Christ. When it comes to silence in the Bible, when it comes to silence in general, it can be very awkward. It can be very um, something that we stray from, especially in our society. You ever been at a dinner table where it goes quiet and you'd say, I'd say anything, almost to the point of embarrassing yourself sometimes to, to stop quietness. Uh, in fact, one of the most unproductive things is to have dead air time for television networks or or radio shows. You want to have voices sounding and you don't want silence. You don't want it at all. And yet so key to the gospel message is the silences that we read about. So significant. I'm reminded that one of my favorite instances of silences 
and in all the Old Testament come from that great story of David and Goliath. When for 40 days, Goliath marched out into the Valley of Elah and he asked for a contender and there was silence. Silence day after day after day after day. 40 days of silence come when that giant asked for a contender. And then the silence was broken by a small shepherd boy named David who came from Bethlehem and slew that man. You say, oh, that was sweet. Isn't it great when silence is broken? You know, for 4,000 years, Satan asked for a man on this earth. And there was silence for 4,000 years. No man could contend with the power of darkness. For 4,000 years, there was a silence that was stifling and was frightening. And then one day, there came a man from Nazareth. He opened up his mouth and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the gospel to the poor. It was just this man who would defeat Satan, who would end the silence that had, 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 had worn this world thin. How tremendous to think of the man who broke that silence. I think of silence in this world and I think of how key it is because we believe in a God who loves to communicate. The first chapter of our Bibles over and over again tells me of a God who said, a God who spake, a God who spake, and a God who said. And over and over again, it tells me of a God who loves to communicate. The last chapter in our Bible, you read it, and it tells me over and over and over again about the words, the words, the words, the words. In fact, the Lord Jesus there calls himself the alphabet. It's of a God who wants to communicate and loves to speak. And yet at times there have been silences. And silences tell us something so monumental about this gospel message. In fact, one of the longest periods of silences that God has ever inflicted on mankind came just before Jesus Christ came into this world. And for four centuries, men had it heard from God. No prophet, no voice from heaven, nothing. And men almost grew weary thinking, will he ever communicate with us again? And thank God that his final communication came after four centuries of silence. And there appeared there. In Nazareth, a man, Jesus of Nazareth, and he stood up and he said he was the one who had come for the brokenhearted. He was the one who had come to preach this same message that I'm telling you tonight, the gospel message, the good news. What a tremendous way in to break silence, but silence almost makes us yearn for a voice. And men and women yearn to hear a voice that would tell them the way back to the Father. And never was it as clear Never was it as sharp as when it came to the voice of the Father's Son. And God's Son, he spoke. You know, for a man who is the, considered to be the most incredible man who has ever walked planet Earth, it's amazing that most of his life was spent in silence. Most of his life, he lived for 33 years. All of his words, a majority of what he said came from his last week on Earth. His last week gives us a majority of what he said, and here's a man, exceptional. He's the author of scripture. He's God's communication, and yet you say, how unbelievable that for over 30 of his years, we, we just have, a, we have a, a few words, silence. It tells me something about this man, Jesus Christ. It tells me something that he was living for the audience of one. He was living for the audience of his father, and his father was so pleased in him so pleased in his son. It didn't take words on the behalf of Jesus Christ. It took his actions. You know, actions do speak louder than words. And I know in my own life, my actions speak louder than my words. My characteristics will not come from my mouth. They will come from what I have done in this life. And the Bible tells me I have done nothing worthy of salvation, nothing from these hands. In fact, the hymn writer said, nothing in these hands I bring. But I depend on the words and the actions of another, Jesus Christ. But it's amazing that God, silent for so many years. Jesus Christ, silent for so many years. In fact, I'm reminded of a way in which silence was broken there. If you're familiar with the narrative of Jesus Christ, he was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. And everybody who got baptized in the Jordan River, the Bible tells us, they did this one thing. They confess their sins. Quite a transparent moment. I don't know if you or I would want to be part of that. But as they were baptized in that river, 
Uh, they, they had to confess the sins that they had done. They had to confess the evils of their heart. And that would have been that would have been a quite a frightening experience if you had everyone around you that day and you had to come up out of those waters and you had to confess what you had done wrong in your life. And then there was the day that Jesus Christ was baptized and the Bible says that there was silence. Nothing. It was absolutely quiet. Why? Because he had no sins to confess. He had not a sin to tell of. You say, that must have been an awkward silence. The crowds must have looked on on the banks of the Jordan as they stared down at John the Baptist and Jesus Christ and wondered, who's going to break this silence? A man who had never sinned, didn't have a sin to confess. You know who broke the silence that day? The God of heaven. He ripped open the heavens and he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What a sweet way to break silence. Have you ever thought that the man, Jesus Christ, who did not have a sin of his own, that the reason that he came into this world was to die for your sins, to take your sins upon himself. Not only had God interrupted his silence with his son, not only had Jesus Christ spent most of his life in silence only to speak in order for individuals to know that he came to declare the good news, not only was silence in his life broken by his father, but significantly, we, we come to Calvary. We come to the place Calvary, a Friday in April in the year AD 33. And the Bible tells us, and we read it tonight, we read it here in the book of Isaiah. He opened not his mouth. He was before his judge, judges, and they were amazed that he had nothing to say in his defense. He opened not his mouth. You know how hard it is to stand, especially when you're wrongfully accused. Think of our day today. Everyone's speaking about justice and justice, and they want to open their mouth so that they can tell you the justice they deserve. And yet here's a man who established justice, and he opened not his mouth when men wrongfully condemned him. He opened not his mouth when he was wrongfully accused. He said nothing in his defense. He went to Calvary. We have seven different sayings of Jesus Christ on the cross, and not one of them tells me of him making a defense of himself. Why? Why? Why did he not open his mouth? Why did he not defend himself? Why did he not give a reason for why people had him wrongfully accused? For this reason. Because he was there for me. He was there for my sins. He was there for my mouth. He was there because my mouth runs rampant. Because a man is not judged by what goes into him, but what comes out of his mouth. He was there for my sins. He was paying my cost. He could not give a defense of me that day because I was defenseless. No attorney could defend me. And so instead, Jesus Christ bore my penalty at Calvary. And the Bible says he was led as a lamb before her shears is dumb. He opened not his mouth as a lamb to the slaughter. He opened not his mouth. One who did not open his mouth. How significant, how tremendous that you could know this man tonight. This man who endured silence in order that you could open your lips this evening and for the first time, not take the name Christian upon yourself because what you have done, but be able to call yourself a believer in Jesus Christ because of what he did, because of his silence. You know, the Bible says, you can read this verse later on in Romans 3 and 19. It says this, it says, all the world will become guilty before God. And just before it says this, it tells me that every mouth, will be stopped. Every mouth will be shut. There will be silence. The Bible tells me that actually one time there's silence in heaven for about half an hour. That's a tremendous silence. I would almost imagine this is probably one of the most tremendous silences known to man. And it's men and women who are silent. They can't open their mouths. Why? Because they realize they're guilty before their creator. You say, that's a terrible thing. That's terrible. Why would anybody want to be guilty? And why would they want to have their mouth shut? You know, if you were just to realize that it's not what these lips are going to produce is going to save my soul. But if I recognized I was guilty, how quickly, how quickly I would turn to the words of Jesus Christ. If I knew I was guilty before my creator. I knew I had sinned, 
how quickly this mouth would shut and how quickly my ears would become attentive to the words of the man who died to save me. Because it's in those words that I have placed my confidence. It's the words of Jesus Christ that assure me that if I died in my sins, I couldn't be with, with him. It's the words of Jesus Christ that assure me that God loved me and gave his son for me and that believing on him, I have everlasting life. It's those words. As you continue to listen to Matt, listen to Matt speak tonight. Take notice of the times that the Lord Jesus spoke, spoke loudly of the times he broke his silence. But remember this. He opened not his mouth at Calvary because he was dying for me. One day I won't be able to open my mouth and thank God I won't have to because my only plea, my only reason for being in heaven will not come from what I have said, but will come from what Christ has done and from what Christ has said himself. Continue to listen. And tonight, really know your sins forgiven. No salvation is yours because of Christ and what he has done at the cross and because of what he has said, because he suffered and he opened not his mouth in order that you could open your lips tonight and thank the God of heaven for salvation, vast, full, and free. Thanks, Dave. Uh, we're going to read a verse today, and it's just one verse. I'm going to speak on the word loud, uh, perhaps not in the capacity that was planned, but uh, there's 61 times loud is mentioned in scripture. And uh, the one verse that I have on my heart is found in the book of John. If you have a Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and John's gospel and chapter 19. You know, some have said that on April 18th, 1775, the shot heard around the world during the American Revolution, it changed time. I would comment to you that, yes, that was a powerful moment. But there's words here in John chapter 19 and verse 30 that were heard around the world, not necessarily in volume as far as loudness, but in their capacity and weight. So listen to John chapter 19 and verse 30. And it says, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said three words, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Other words for that is it is completed. It is accomplished would be even a better translation. So we're going to look at loud statements, perhaps made in volume, but also loud in their power or loud in their weight, not necessarily volume. Last Sunday, we spoke, if you're with us, we spoke on being sick and whole. Luke chapter five says these words in verse 31, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, Christ is saying, but he came to call sinners to repentance. The context there, when we're looking at the gospel here, the context is there's Pharisees watching and they're asking, they're saying, why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus reiterates why he came. And it was true over 2000 years ago, why he came. And it is true tonight. He came not to heal those that are whole. He came to heal those that are sick. And there's a day that Dave on this call was broken. There's a day I was broken. There's a day we were sick in our sins. And there's a day we needed to be made whole. And it was the day that I came to trust in what Christ did for me on a rugged cross over 2,000 years ago, that he paid for my sins in full. And the Godhead was satisfied with the work of Christ. And that moment, I became born again. I went from sick unto being whole. I went from being blinded in my sins to first time in my life seeing and seeing for what Christ had done for me on the cross. If I took someone, and you might say, Matt, this is fairly morbid, but if I took someone and laid them out before you, and that person had died, and I asked the audience, I said, what does this particular man need? There's a man lying before you, and he is dead. And the answer that would resound, it would come back right away. I'm sure that everyone on the call would answer this correctly. That man needs life. What the dead man does not need is church membership. They can't be attending because they're attending dead. Now, you know that scripture would teach this is dead spiritually, but just uh, accept my uh, reasoning for right now. They can't worship a statue because they couldn't worship if they were dead. They can't accept a prayer from a church leader because the leader is praying to revive someone who is dead and they don't have the power to raise that person from the dead. There's not a man on earth that can save your soul from the penalty of sins. 
That person who's dead doesn't need good works. They can't do good works when they're dead. As a matter of fact, God says to the sinner that tries to impress God with their works, he says that their, their works are like disgusting rads or like putrefying sores. Their works, the best that man can do is a stench to the holy God of heaven. What the dead need is this. They need life. They need to be made whole. And there is one person, and that's what we're doing through these gospel meetings. We're seeking to point you through God's help and through leading of the Holy Spirit to point you to one person that can make the sick whole. And that person is Christ. There's only one that is Christ that can bring the spiritually dead to life, both physically and spiritually. Jesus did this. He did this with Lazarus. He said with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he had power. God provided Christ at Calvary. Christ lived. He died and he rose again. We can't even say to bring the dead back to life because the Bible teaches we were born sick with the problem of sin. We were born condemned already. We were born dead in our trespasses and sins. So today, if you're on the call, friend, and you've never come to know who Christ, here's the good news. Well, the good news is the gospel. But the good news of Jesus Christ is this. He came to give you life and life more abundantly. Man needs life. They need eternal life. They need life from above, being born from above. That's what Jesus is teaching in John chapter 3. He says, you must be born again. Society needs communities to be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ, to see souls saved, to see souls given peace that passes all understanding, to see revival done in the communities today. There's funding, yes. There's more schools, yes. There's great programs that are pushed into society today. There's great police systems or judicial system. All have positively impacted earthly environments. But God gets deeper. He gets right to the root of the problem. And he says, what needs to be impacted today is past this posterior. It's past this costume. God wants to impact your soul. And when God impacts a soul, a soul that was born in sin is now born from above. The Holy Spirit resides within that, my friend, is what societies need today. Believers having attributes of God because they are born from above, not something that they could come up with on their own. They are born from above, the Holy Spirit working through them, reviving them through the word of God, through daily repentance, through prayer, through a relationship. That's what we're preaching about here, a relationship with the God of heaven, a relationship with Christ. Believers that are merciful, that are kind, that are just, that are filled with goodness, that have holiness, that have righteousness, love. That, friend, is what society needs. Lots of, lots of news on the day today. Lots of chaos. And we're trying to fix all these different problems. What people need today across the world, regardless of what culture you come from, regardless of what background, what part of town you come from, people need to be born again. They need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They need to experience the love that passes all understanding. And it's solely found through the work on the cross. Dave spoke about silence tonight. I'm going to speak about Loudness. The Greek word for loud would mean to be to make a loud noise. The word there is a keo. It means to give forth a sound, like either when you strike a drum or as the roar of the sea, that deafening, echoing, almost train-like sound as it rumbles and crescendos. That's the word really for loud. Or the word echoes, meaning to reverberate sound or the roar of praise. Can I tell you that for eternity, heaven resounded in praise to him with angels worshiping? Yet at silent at Calvary. There was silence. Touching to, to think of those thoughts. For you on the call, the Son of Man has come to seek. Dave spoke on it. To save that which was lost. God's love for the, for the sinner. 61 times in Scripture, this word loud is mentioned. But think about this time when Absalom died. And I'm going to link this to the cross and to God's love for sinners. But when Absalom died and King David was Absalom's father. In 2 Samuel chapter 19, it says this. But the king covered his face. And the king cried with a loud voice, Oh, my son, Absalom. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. He's sad. He has, he's inconsolable. He has hurt. He's in mourning. As a matter of fact, so excessive was David's weeping for his son. Now consider this. He's weeping for a son who wanted to take his life. He's weeping for a son that all throughout Absalom's life, he sought to derail David, to dethrone David, to take David's life. Yet when, when Absalom actually dies, so excessive was David's weeping, his heart's broken for his son, that Job tells him that he's disgraced all his people and his servants because they had won a battle. They had saved his life from his son Absalom. But David's weeping was interrupting that praise or that, that celebration of that battle. 
uncontrolled wailing for a son that wanted David killed. Now think about the father's love for his son. The father's love for his son Christ. Words, words can't describe it. You know, I've heard of fathers wailing in a hospital hallway over the loss of their children. Inconsolable. That love is indescribable. You know what the Bible teaches about the gospel? Listen to this. But God, Romans 5, 8, demonstrates his love toward us in that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Father and the Son are one. The Son loved the Father. The Father loved the Son. Not like some relationships today, having faults. This Son, Christ, brought delight to his Father. No faults on both parts, the Son and the Father. Jesus was the Son in full submission to his Father. Man today has never experienced a relationship like that with their Son. He delighted, listen, to do everything for his father. Never a time when Jesus disobeyed his father. God gives Christ as a sacrifice for man on a cross. That friend is love. That's a love that goes beyond what words can describe. No wonder Paul said, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. In contrast to a man loving a son who would have taken his own life like David and Absalom, God loves his son, yet he loves man so much that he's willing to give the very apple of his eye for mankind. That, friend, is love. Think about the loudness of God declaring his love for his son. John the Baptist, there's strong words of Pharisees. He's going around and he's saying, the one coming after me is more powerful than I, of whom he says, as he's speaking about Christ, I am not worthy to carry his sandals. Now, Jesus comes from Galilee to be baptized of John in the Jordan River. And maybe some of you know this story quite well. John says to Jesus, uh, I need to be baptized from you, but you come to me. And Jesus says, let it happen now, for it is right for us to fulfill all righteousness. And as Jesus is coming out of the water, the scene reveals itself in scriptures. It says, the heavens opened and the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming upon him. In Matthew 3, it says, and suddenly lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But that voice that announced the son then at Calvary was silent just for you. Think about the loudness of God at the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus has just fed 5,000 people. He's just told his disciples to deny themselves and follow him. Now we fast forward a week or so, or maybe eight days or so. Jesus takes Peter, John, and James into a mountain to pray. And Jesus is praying. And as he's praying, his face is transformed and his clothes become brilliantly, brilliantly white. There's two men that appear with him, Moses and Elijah. And they begin to talk with Christ. And as the disciples wake up, Peter says, Lord, Let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And Peter, uh, unintentionally, if I could use those words, he's putting Christ at a parallel with man. And there's a cloud that overshadows them. And a voice from the cloud says these words, this is my beloved son, hear him. And yet that same voice, announcing as it were to the world, my beloved son, that same voice, expressing love for the son at Calvary, was silent just for you. Think of the loudness of disciples praising. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 37, it says these words, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Yet at Calvary, disciples are silent too. At Calvary, God is silent when his son is being crucified for mankind. The loudness of man's crying, crucify him. Notice in scripture as Pilate asked that question, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? In Luke chapter 23 and verse 23, the doctor here writes, but they were insistent. He says, demanding with loud voices that he should be crucified. Voices of the chief priests and them that screamed out crucify him, it prevailed over Pilate and Pilate released him. Crucify him, they yelled, shrieking screaming hatred of man for God's son. You say, well, who was silent then? God was silent. Christ was silent. Led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before a shears is dumb. He opened, not his mouth. Angels hovered at Calvary, perhaps inches from the face of Christ, but they were silent. And that was the first time that they were silent in all of time and all of eternity. For you, for me, man's spittle, the scoffing of man, the mocking of man, the lashing of man, the beating of man, the screaming of man, yet Christ is silent, yet God is silent. In the New English translation, in Isaiah 53, it says this, all of us had wandered off like sheep. Each of us had strayed off on his own path, but the Lord caused the sin of all of us 
to attack him. The Greek word there to take the full brunt and force of the attack. That Christ took the attack. And verse 7, he was treated harshly and afflicted. But he did not even open his mouth. Silence like a lamb led to the slaughtering block. Like a sheep silent before his shears. He did not even open his mouth. He was led away after an unjust trial. But who even cared? Indeed, he was cut off from the land of the living because of the rebellion of his own people, his own creation. He was wounded. Christ was wounded. He was wounded for you. He was wounded for me. And Christ, in his full desire to please the Father and complete the work of salvation for the human race once and forever. Notice the loudness of Christ's announcement here in John chapter 19 and verse 30. Many important announcements. The Bill of Rights, an important announcement. Paul Revere's silent announcement. Notice that uh, many, as you read books, but it talks about Paul Revere as he went through and uh, he said, the British are coming. That's not true. <laughs> Paul Revere's announcement of the British coming was silent. One if by land, two if by sea. Lanterns. But he announced the British were coming. It helped shape the freedoms that you and I enjoy to this day. Senator John F. Kennedy, an announcement he made after spending 40 months touring every state in the Union. He announces on January 2nd, 1960, his candidacy for the presidency of the United States. A huge announcement, but there's one announcement. It changed time and it changed eternity. John chapter 19 and verse 30, and Jesus said, and the scripture does not say that Jesus shouted. It doesn't say that. It just said, Jesus said, I believe with authority. I believe loud, not in its volume, but loud in its power and its capacity. It is finished. The most powerful words reach the ear and the heart of God for the saving of humanity. As Christ on a cross said, it is finished. That word derived from the Greek word telos, it means this. It's ended or to complete a process, to bring to an end, to finish, to complete something. In regards to time, it means to come to an end or to be over. But don't just take the Greek definition. Listen to the perfect tense of this verb. It's vital. The word is tetelestiai. Listen to what it means. It means to signify past action, like the cross work. Christ died over 2,000 years ago. That past action, the effect of which continues in the present, it's, it was completed then, and it is still completed today, and will still be completed for all of time and all of eternity. Very interesting as scholars, they're, they're finding papyrus scraps with Greek writing, and they're receipts. And these receipts are introduced with the word telelestiai, meaning the bill has been paid off, or the obligation completed, or the debt paid in full. What was finished when Christ said it is finished? The whole will of God, listen carefully, to redeem man, finished. That he would be incarnate, be exposed to shame and reproach and suffer things that no human being could ever endure, and he died, finished. The whole work his father gave Christ to do, preach the gospel, work miracles, obtain eternal salvation for his people, pay for sins once and forever, finished. The whole righteousness of the law, Fulfilled, finished. Perfect obedience yielded, finished. The penalty of death endured, finished. Perfect righteousness finished, agreeable to the law, finished. Sin was made an end of it, full atonement and satisfaction for it given, finished. Complete pardon procured, not partial pardon procured. Not a it wouldn't be pardoned. Complete pardon procured, peace made, a redemption from all iniquity obtained finished all enemies conquered finished christ did that and he did it on a cross all types promises and prophecies fulfilled christ's own course of life as he lived for over 33 years or 33 years rather finished and it's done entirely without the help of man and it can't be undone it's finished and jesus announced that with three words it is finished it is interesting as albert einstein said these words once and we still hold to it today uh, if you look at any uh, classroom today, you might see these words from Albert Einstein. It says this, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. Can I suggest this? That in the middle of the work at Calvary, unbearable sufferings of man's doing, the silence of the Godhead while Christ hung between heaven and earth, Christ, the Godhead, knew the opportunity that lay at hand. In the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. What was that opportunity, you say? Salvation of souls. There's some on this call. They've been saved by the grace of God. Sin's penalty paid. The Godhead satisfied for all of time. 
and all of eternity. God says here in his love, not that we love God, but he loved us. And he sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Christ proved the finished work through his resurrection as Jesus is now seated at the very right hand of God. You know what Hebrews 10 tells us? Verse 11 and 12. You can read for it on your own. And every priest stands day after day serving and offering the same sacrifices again and again. Sacrifices that could never take away sins. Listen to verse 12. But when this priest Christ had offered one sacrifice for sins for all time. He sat down at the right hand of God where he is now waiting until his enemies are made a footstool of his feet. Finished. It is finished. The greatest, most powerful, loudest words that ever touched humanity in all of time and words that impact us for all of eternity. Let me close with a hymn I was just enjoying by Robert Murray McShane, another individual that loved the gospel, 1813 to 1843. He, they, we, there's a hymn titled, When This Passing World Is Done. It's really an abbreviation to his poem titled, I Am a Debtor. But just listen to these words. And he uses this phrase, then Lord shall I fully know, not till then how much I owe. He's not saying that we owe something to God for our salvation. He's just saying that out of his heart, expresses thanksgiving and gratitude for the work of Christ. You'll never understand the weight that was accomplished on the place called Calvary. But listen to these words. And some of you might have might know this hymn, but there's some words that you might not be familiar with. When this, I'm not going to read the whole one, but let me read a couple of stanzas. When this passing world is done, when has sunk yon glaring sun? When we stand with Christ in glory, that's the words of the original, uh, I am a debtor, looking o'er life's finished story, then Lord shall I fully know, not till then how much I owe to the work of the cross, to the work of Christ. But listen to these words, solemn here as he continues. When I hear the wicked call on the rocks and hills to fall. You see that in Revelation. When I see them start and shrink on the fiery deluge brink, then Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. He's reflecting on when the wicked perish outside of Christ. And he understands that he's been won, he's been bought, and he comes to trust Christ. Not till then, how much I owe. Then he says, says these words, when I stand before the throne, dressed in beauty, not my own. When I see thee, he says to Christ, as you are, love thee with unsinning heart. Then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. But this is the verse that I really love as it touches the loudest, the crescendoing worship. You see that in Revelation in chapter five, but Robert writes these words, Mr. McShane, when the praise of heaven I hear, loud as thunders to the ear, loud as many waters noise, sweet as harps melodious voice, then Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. Chosen not for good in me, wakened up from wrath to flee, hidden in the Savior's side by the Spirit, sanctified. Teach me, Lord, he writes, on earth to show by my love how much I owe. We know those words in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. If you're on the call today, you'd love to be saved. If you're on the call today, you've heard the gospel perhaps over and over, and you say, Matt, I just want to know I'm going to heaven. I just want to know my sins have been paid. I just want to know I have peace with God. Listen to these words, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, that you are saved for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man would boast. I close with a quote from Charles Spurgeon. As Dave spoke on these words, he trusts nothing else than what Christ said of him through the scripture. So let me, let's, let's listen to what Charles Spurgeon says. He says this, and I'm going to close and pray. If you rest on the finished, Charles Spurgeon, if you rest on the finished work of Jesus, you have already the best evidence of your salvation in the world. You have God's word for it. What more is needed? That's what he says. If you have rested on the finished work of Jesus, you have already the best evidence of your salvation in the world. You have God's word for it. What more is needed? Come to Christ tonight. Know your sins forgiven. Have a home in heaven and know Christ as your savior.